Hi, everyone. Um, I was uh, obviously I'm not from Wisconsin, but I'm very happy uh, to come talk to you about alfalfa autotoxicity. Um, I'm not happy that I have to talk about it, but um, we have some research going on um, that we think is really going to end up helping the industry. So if I can get my actual. Oh, there we go. Um, what is autotoxicity exactly? Um, this is a kind of a chemical uh, issue with the plant that we refer to as uh, allelopathy, which means that plants are, are secreting toxins that prevent other plants from being able to grow around them. And in the case of alfalfa, this is actually, um, it's only toxic to itself. So basically it is toxic to its own seedlings. Other plants can grow around it just, fi just fine. Um, we're not entirely sure why it does this, but it probably relates to its, uh, its development in a fairly dry climate where it really wasn't much of an advantage to have a crowded um, situation around uh, yourself. This is the only forage that we know of where this occurs, but it does happen in other crops as well, such as uh, some well-known examples are strawberries, cucumbers, apples, and asparagus, and other things. Uh, we don't really understand how it works in those crops either. Um, but what we do think, at least, that we know for alfalfa um, is that the toxins are concentrated in the leaves and flowers. Um, there's less of them in the stems and roots, and I probably should... Uh, mention here that we don't know exactly what the toxins are. There are many compounds that have been um, suggested as playing a role, and um, we think it's probably um, more than one. Uh, we do know that they at least appear to be water-soluble compounds. We know that this compound will disappear from soil over time, but most of the rest of my talk is going to be talking about um, the it depends factor uh, of that. Um, and we think that these compounds are probably phenols, um, which have many other functions in the plant. The plant's not putting them out there for no reason, um, but uh, what they are, don't know. So there are some practical consequences of autotoxicity for us as we grow alfalfa. Um, and one is that this is the reason why it is not possible to thicken alfalfa stands up by overseeding into an existing stand. As those plants start to thin out with age, you cannot usually successfully go out there and plant more alfalfa into that field and thicken it back up. You can plant other things. You can plant clovers, you can plant grasses, all kinds of other things could be used to help extend the life of the stand, but not more alfalfa. Uh, this is also the reason why we are very concerned with the replanting interval after we terminate an alfalfa stand, because if we go back in there too soon, we may actually see reduced or failed establishment where we just don't have seeds germinate or be able to get started. You can see that here in the upper picture. The autotoxic plot um, on the left is much thinner. Um, and the other, actually probably more important factor is that even if we do get new seedlings established, um, they appear to have lifetime damage to their root systems that they cannot actually fully recover from. Um, and we refer to this as auto conditioning or auto suppression. It may not be really obvious to you that that is happening. But what happens underground is that we know that the autotoxins um, damage the taproot of the plant. So when you have a normal plant that we're seeing here on the right with its nice uh, thick taproot that can go way down into the soil, like Scott was mentioning, and over on the other side, we have damaged plants where they've lost their taproot. Uh, they try and compensate by making more side roots, but those side roots don't go as deep. So this plant just doesn't have um, the yield potential of a a normal one. If you take a look at this field, I'm going to give you a second here, but I hope that your pictures are good enough that you can see that this field is looks better on the right hand side of the screen. So what is happening here is that this was a field um, that was all planted in 2013. The prior history of the field is that on the right hand side, it had been in corn for two years before it was planted to alfalfa. Um, and on the left, it had had a previous alfalfa stand terminated in 2011, 
grew corn in 2012, replanted the alfalfa 2013. Um, you may all remember that 2012 was also a significant drought year across the upper Midwest. Um, so while this normally would have been a good replanting interval in that case, it was not. But also I want you to think for a second that if you were only looking at the left-hand side of this field and you couldn't see the right-hand side, would you look at that field and say, well, okay, that's an okay reseeding. Um, you just don't know when you don't have anything to directly compare to it that you've actually lost some yield. So there are many factors that influence um, the autotoxicity, and obviously a big one is water. Um, but the influence of water is really strongly related to the um, soil texture. Um, the toxins are water soluble, as I mentioned before. They tend to be fairly loosely held onto sand soil particles and tightly held to silt and clay, um, similar to you know many other things that are in our soil. Um, but the sandy soil is therefore going to allow more of it to leach out faster. Uh, but we do also know that right at the time of termination, the sandy soils tend to be more toxic than a uh, heavier soil. So the graph is showing what that would look like. The sandy soil, very toxic at the beginning, but it dissipates quickly, whereas the loamy soil is less toxic at the beginning. It takes longer to get rid of it. And all of this is going to be very dependent on the amount of water that's actually moving through this soil, which is where the drought comes in. So some of our research here has shown that when you um, try and grow alfalfa seedlings in um, soil that has different concentrations of tissue extract in it, um, we use root length as a measurement of the degree of autotoxicity. So a damaged root is shorter. We would like to see long roots. So what we've seen in this work is that we tend to see an effect starting to happen um, on root length uh, when you hit about 10 grams of tissue in um, a liter of water. So what does that actually mean in terms of what you might have out there in the field? So I did some rough uh, conversions of what <clears throat> 10 grams per liter might mean in a field situation. Um, if one inch of rain is going to give you 2.3 liters per square foot of ground surface and one ton of dry matter left at, at termination is equivalent to 21 grams of dry matter um, per square foot. Um, and that's going to roughly work out to be about nine grams per liter of tissue in the water that's moved through that soil. Um, and that's about where we start to see the, the problems. So obviously, if there's more than one inch of water, or maybe you have more or less than one ton of residue, that's going to affect um, the concentration that's moving out there. There are also other things in play. We know that the older the plants are, the more toxin will build up around it, because it's just had more time to do it. Um, there's a conventional thought that our first year seedling stands, if that fails, that we're not going to have very much autotoxin there. But um, I've seen enough anecdotal fields that I'm a little uncomfortable with making that blanket statement, uh, because I think in some cases, if the seedling stand has been able to make flowers, if it's old enough to have made flowers, and uh, you have the right other conditions, we may also be seeing autotoxicity there. Uh, but we do know that the older it is, the more there is. Uh, but you think, well, in an older stand, the plants are more spread out. So maybe that counteracts the fact that they're more toxic. So how spread out do they have to be? Um, we have some classic research that was done by John Jennings um, at, in Missouri at the time, showing that if you um, have eight inches between your existing crowns, it is likely that you are going to have seedling death. Um, if you have crowns that are 16 inches apart, it's likely you're going to have that auto conditioning problem. And he calculated that you need less than 0 0.8 crowns per square foot in order to have a successful reestablishment. And just for comparison, I will point out that our economic replacement threshold for alfalfa is five crowns per square foot. So that's much higher than where you would have to get to um, to be able to avoid um, autotoxicity just because the stand was thin. So a, an effort to help farmers determine whether or not um, how or how concerned they need to be about this, the alfalfa management guide um, 
which I hope a lot of you have, have an autotoxicity scorecard in them, which helps assess the risk of different things, such as how much top growth was there at termination, less is better, um, what is the disease resistance of the new variety that you're going to plant. We don't think this is a disease per se, but if the plants are tougher, that always helps. What is the rainfall irrigation potential before reseeding? And if you want to see what that risk looks like, uh, we consider it to be a high risk if there has been less than an inch of water between termination and reseeding, um, and a low risk if there's more than two. Uh, but you also have all these other things in place, such as the soil type. Uh, we do know that tillage helps dissipate this problem. Um, So what are our current uh, management recommendations? Just traditionally, we just tell people to wait six to 24 months after termination before you replant. Um, riskier would be a shorter interval, such as a spring termination followed by a summer fallow or maybe a summer annual crop and then replant in the fall. Obviously under drought conditions, that's not very much time. You could terminate in the fall, do a winter fallow and replant in the spring, which works pretty well for some some people. Um, you could do a fall termination and then grow another crop totally for one to two years before you come back in. It's probably your best bet. Um, I mentioned tillage. This is not something that uh, for crop agronomists like to generally recommend that people use tillage, but this is one of the circumstances where it does really help. Um, it probably is stimulating microbial activity in the soil because we know when we mix air in there, we make those microbes just go to town and they're probably helping break down our toxin faster. And if you are in a very dry situation, I would say go to the longer end of the window of possibility. Okay. Just to um, update a little bit on our research, uh, we have been working for some years now on a soil bioassay here at Michigan State with the idea being, could we develop a quick test that farmers could just send a, a soil sample in to the diagnostic lab and we could quickly tell them whether or not it is toxic to their plants. We do bioassays for a lot of other things. We thought, why wouldn't it work here? Um, and this was funded through your alfalfa checkoff money. Yay for that program and also some state money called Project Green that we got there. And the status that we currently have, we are uh, growing uh, alfalfa seedlings in a petri dish in a growth chamber um, with about three ounces of dry field soil uh, that has been moistened. We treat them with a fungicide so we're not getting um, contamination by soil diseases. They, um, we grow them at 72 hours for four days in a growth chamber, wash the roots off, measure the root length, and then report that as a uh, percent of a control potting soil. So over here on the side, our potting soil is on the bottom, our test soil on the top, and we are able to detect differences among soils where alfalfa has been present looking at the root length of these bioassays. We then moved it to field validation where we actually killed existing al alfalfa stands at either long or short replanting intervals, um, which were 90 days for the long interval and 14 to 30 days for the short one. And we compared that to sites that had not previously had alfalfa. Um, we were able to induce autotoxicity in these plots. So if you look at yield the following year, um, we did have reduction over our control plots when we had uh, these both long and short replanting intervals. You can see the difference in the plant height here. Unfortunately, our bioassay turned out not to be very accurate at predicting this. Um, we did test it at the time of replanting and our bioassay would sometimes say it was toxic, which would always end up actually being toxic, but sometimes it would tell, it, tell us with that four day assay that it was not toxic. That's a problem for a commercial test. Uh, because we, if it says it's toxic, we can be certain that it is. But if it says it is not toxic, we cannot be certain it is. And we do not want to do a commercial test with a false negative in it because then we're gonna tell you that it's okay to go ahead and plant when it is not, all right? So we haven't given up on this. We're still working on tweaking it. But we don't consider this to be a, 
a total fail because the bioassay still has great value as a research tool because now we have a tool that will at least tell us, yes, we are certain that this soil is going to be toxic. And that gives us a way to do more controlled experiments where we can try and do a number of things. Um, and we recently got a big grant um, from USDA of uh, just under $10 million where, no, sorry, I don't have that right there. That actually should be $946,000. Sorry, I'm overstating my, my grant. Um, but we are trying to use our preliminary results to find out some new things. We want to identify these toxins, okay? We want to study the role of root exudates, soil microbes, and soil fertility um, on this problem because in our preliminary work, we have found a number of clues that we may not have been looking at some of the right things in previous research that other labs have done on this. Um, we need to know, are the toxins actually in the plant at the time they affect the seedling or are they now out in the rhizosphere or in the environment around the roots? We need to know how soil microbes are involved in this. Um, and we have seen some significant clues that autotoxicity may actually be increasing when the previous alfalfa stand was under nutrient stress, um, which makes sense in an older stand. But that's one of the reasons that plants um, secrete compounds into the rhizosphere is to help them obtain nutrients when nutrients are under short supply. Um, and we also have uh, a breeding component in this research that's being done at Cornell by Dr. Ginny Moore to actually see if we can start to breed um, our varieties away from autotoxicity. We know there are genetic differences, but it has never been systematically studied. 